The Hyde Park Picture House is one of the UK's oldest surviving cinemas. We've invited this audience to watch a film whose release attracted more people than Star Wars. A film that captured the horror and the humanity of a great European battle. That would have been the first vision of war that people ever had. This program looks beyond the images to one of the men who filmed them. He's prepared to take risks that no one else will take. This is some of the most remarkable film ever shot. He loves to tell a story, and I think he knows how to tell a story. What he now does is he just brings the camera around so that the men now come over the top. In this program, we'll retrace his journey to the front lines and ask why his record of the Battle of the Somme still has a place in film history. If ever one has a debate about the depiction of the horrors of war, this is the place where we start this discussion. Across the rolling farmland of the Somme, Europe has remembered the fallen. At Tiepval's memorial to the missing, the congregation gazed into the faces of men who fell a century ago. Unique combat footage from the man who called himself Malins of No Man's Land. The fashionable Sussex resort of Hastings, a world away from the storms which were gathering across Europe. This is where Geoffrey Malins grew up in the late 19th century. One of a large family, he'd started work as a photographer and he was determined to make something of himself. He's charming, definitely, a real entrepreneur from his time and full of energy, really got that, and a real artist in his own way. He worked commercially, as well as doing lots of private portraits and things like that. He was very much involved in the community that he was working in at the time, and that he was very much wanting to better his career, if you like, so he took opportunities when they came up, and he took them with kind of enthusiasm and excitement. Taking a good studio portrait requires a good deal of skill and imagination. As a portrait photographer, Malin sort of acquired quite a number of useful studio skills, a good working understanding of the technologies of film and cameras. Malin's was undoubtedly an ambitious man. Uh, he was very keen to, to make a go of whatever he tried out. He was also a very good self-promoter. And within a few years, Malin's ever the entrepreneur had spotted a fresh opportunity. There was still a place for beautifully composed photos on Edwardian bookshelves, but Geoffrey Malin's was tempted away by the moving image. It was called kinematography, and it gave people a mix of drama and comedy. Malins took a job as a cameraman, initially working on short feature films and then moving to newsreels. The newsreels really began in France in about 1908 and were exported to the UK in 1910. A lot of early newsreel footage is shot outdoors. Equally, some of the equipment was cumbersome to say the least. Here we've got three cameras which are typical examples of the kind of cameras that neutral cameramen would have been using around the First World War period. So the largest one at the end here is a British made one, made by Moyen Basti uh, from about 1909 onwards. Sold to be simple, reliable and very easy to use. When you've got a hand-cranked camera, 
you get camera movement. So often you're creating footage which actually isn't usable. So this one, you would pump up these compressed air cylinders which are housed within the camera. It takes about 10 minutes to pump it up completely. And that would give you a few minutes of filming time in the field without having to crank the camera. In 1914, newsreel companies were scrambling to cover a breaking story in mainland Europe. Geoffrey Malin's first opportunity to prove his worth as a news cameraman had arrived faster than he could have imagined. In London, filmmakers saw their plans scuppered by military chiefs who initially opposed any suggestion that news cameras should be allowed on the battlefield and banned British companies from the Western Front. But as the armies dug in, the need for effective propaganda brought a change of heart. There's an audience hungry for images of what's happening out there. Initially, this space is covered, if you like, by Belgian, French and German coverage of the war. And this material becomes very highly prized for British filmmakers. So they're applying pressure on the British Army and the, and the state to, re, to be more relaxed about its attitude. And finally, by the autumn of 1915, there's an agreement, first of all, that correspondents and stills cameramen will be allowed and then by October 1915 two cine cameramen, two commercial newsreel cameramen are sent over to France. Geoffrey Malins was one of them and he soon found himself in uniform. Over the next few months, he travelled throughout northern France and Belgium, sending a series of dispatches back to the editing rooms in London. They are conducted everywhere by military intelligence officer in charge of press. Now, if they want to get anywhere, you have to have a military vehicle, and apparently the vehicle is only available to them in three days out of five. They are totally reliant on the army to move around the Western Front. Not only is it quite inaccessible physically, it's bloody dangerous. Several times on the journey, shrapnel and splinters buried themselves in the mud close by. When I reached the firing trench, all our men were standing to arms, awaiting their orders. I placed sandbags on either side of the camera and started to film. By the summer of 1916, Malins had arrived behind British lines near the town of Albert on the Somme. He and a colleague, J.B. McDowell, began filming the preparations which were underway for what was termed the Great Offensive. Malins was told that he was being given a chance to watch history being made. As the skies lightened in the early hours of July the 1st, 1916, Geoffrey Malins and his escorts made their way towards the front line. Around them, tens of thousands of men, French and British, were waiting for the signal to attack. I've been in all sorts of places under heavy shell fire, but nothing, absolutely nothing, compared with the frightful and demoralizing nature of the shellfire I experienced on that journey. In front was a roadway pitted with shell holes, and there, lined up, were some of our men.
Where we are now at Beaumont is at the northern end of the entire attack. The whole thing extends a bit to our, our north and then down to the south, about 18 miles. And Malins can really only cover with his camera a very small segment of the battle. So he's got to be very, very careful of what he does. What Malins does is he's filmed this way. What he now does is he just brings the camera around and he's lined it all up beautifully so that the men now come over the top, passing in front of his camera. Andy Robertshaw has matched Malin's movements a century ago with today's terrain. He was able to place us in the exact spot where Malin's filmed one of his most famous sequences. At about 6.20 in the morning, he gets to here and he sets his camera up and the lane is full of soldiers waiting to attack off towards the Germans. So this, is a, this is a still frame from the film. I can see there the bottom of the lane. They are sitting virtually here, these guys. Yeah, I mean, these guys are sat almost exactly where we are. I think Malins is roughly the same height. He's filming slightly down. And there's a guy on the right hand side with his hands in his pockets. So some of the guys are looking very concerned, others very relaxed. For many of these men, this is the last time that they will be alive. Within an hour, they'll be going over the top. And for some of these people, the last image their family would ever have of them is that big silver screen with their loved one's face looking out at them. That must have happened repeatedly because these men are going to be dead within a few hours. An hour later, Malins and his party scrambled into position as engineers prepared to detonate a huge mine under the German trenches. Time, 7.19 a.m. My hand grasped the handle of the camera. I set my teeth. The ground where I stood gave a mighty convulsion. The earth rose in the air to the height of hundreds of feet. With a horrible, grinding roar, the earth fell back upon itself, leaving in its place a mountain of smoke. Throughout that long and bloody day, Malins and McDowell, a few miles apart, captured the scale and the futility of the attack. Shell after shell crashed in the middle of them, leaving ghastly gaps, but other men quickly filled them up, passing through the smoke and over the bodies of their comrades. Hampered by their heavy equipment and the risks of moving around, the cameramen still managed to capture a series of scenes which would shock audiences back home as the casualties, dead and injured, were brought in. Scenes crowded in upon me, wounded and more wounded. Men who a few hours before had leapt over the parapet full of life and vigour were now dribbling back some of them shattered and broken for life. Around 70,000 men were killed or injured on the first day of the battle. More than 57,000 of them were from Britain and the Commonwealth. The full scale of the carnage didn't hit home with Geoffrey Malins until he found himself filming a roll call in the trenches after the first disastrous attacks. He described what he saw in his memoirs. In one little space, there were just two thin lines, all that was left of a glorious regiment. The ghastly scenes of which I was witness will always remain a hideous nightmare in my memory.
A few weeks later, those scenes were being shown to a military intelligence committee in London. There was debate over the content, but in the end, Malins and his producer convinced the government that the film was worth more than a series of short newsreel items. According to the supervisory editor, he's the most important man putting this film together after Cameraman. When he saw the power of this material, when it first comes back to London, when Malins and McDowell bring about 8,000 feet of this footage, he then persuades the war office, no, no, this, this is great stuff, let's turn it into a feature length film. Geoffrey Malins and his colleague had produced extraordinary footage, but some was not what it appeared to be. The initial problem is that the film needed a climax, and the climax had to be the moment when the big push happened, when the troops go over the top. Now, Malins did film that, and the film that he took survives in the finished product. It's extremely small figures doing very unclear things in the di extreme distance, and as a visual climax to a film, it's absolutely useless. So you, you can understand the impulse that would say, we've got to have something better. Unable to capture that key moment, Malins had staged it behind the lines. This piece of film really sums up everybody's view of the opening seconds of the Battle of the Somme. It's not on the Somme, it's not on the 1st of July, they're not even really soldiers taking part in the battle. There's the officer going forward, then everybody falls. That man looks back at the camera, then he falls back. And in the next sequence, that man falls, that man falls, that man moves, having been shot apparently, and this man looks at the camera, crosses his legs. But the majority of the film was all too real. In the months following its release, over 20 million people went to see it, half of the UK population. The government believed the film would convince audiences to stand behind the war effort, but its no-holds-barred approach was more than some people could take. People are very shocked by what they see. One account is that people cry out at the famous over-the-top sequence, oh my God, he's been shot. The general consensus was that uh, if the purpose of the film was to expose the civilians on the home front to the realities of life on the Western Front, then death was one of those realities. Above all, Malins and his colleagues had tried to show the humanity of life at the front. In picture houses all over Britain, families searched the faces for a glimpse of someone they knew or loved. Now there he is, there. That's my dad, Walter. And there he is again. He spotted himself walking along a trench with carrying a stretcher. And he called out in surprise, that's me. David Lidamore's father recognised himself in this shot 50 years later. Seeing that picture of those men going through that trench, I feel what he must have felt like in the war when some of his mates must have been hit by shells and bombs and buried alive in mud and trenches. Now that's, that's what I feel. Geoffrey Malin's experiences on the Western Front took their toll. Ill health forced him home before the war ended. He'd risked his own life on countless occasions to get the shots he needed. I have tried all the time to realise I was the eyes and ears of millions. In my pictures, I have tried to catch something of the glamour, as well as the awful horror of it all, worthy of being preserved as a permanent memorial of the greatest drama in history. They really captured the spirit of the soldiers. And for me, it was more um, about what the audiences would have felt at home. Like with 20 million seeing it, you can guarantee that if you're in the audience, there's either someone you know in that film or someone that you know of. What I liked about it the most was that it was very honest and unscripted and, um, and very real and 
I found it very moving. I thought it was pitiful seeing everyone streaming to their death. That, that's what I thought was awful. We know when we're looking at those faces that some of those people weren't going to survive the day. And, and that's, that hits you hard as it well. Does really, it? Every time the camera's on the men, they're all looking at the camera. And through that, I felt they're watching us. And what would they make of us a hundred years later? And I had a sense of what's changed. When I look at the film now, what I find remarkable is every time I see the film, I see something new. If ever one has a debate about the depiction of the horrors of war, which incidentally are still not really covered in, on British screens, this is the place where we start this discussion. Journalistic truth, the horrors of war, uh, how does one represent the dead? How does one represent battle? It's all in the Battle of Somme. It's so relevant to us today. Rowena Siavanes feels that connection with the past more than most. She shares her great-grandfather's love of art and storytelling, and to commemorate this centenary, she's preparing an exhibition based around the man and his film. He would be happy that he's inspiring younger generations, and I think with the fuss that's going on this year for the anniversary, I think he would feel that it should be made a fuss of because maybe not necessarily his work but what happened and the fact that he was able to go out there and film and that they were able to document this really significant thing. It's not living memory at all for me anymore. It's still close memory and I think it's really important that that's not lost. During this centenary year, Geoffrey Malin's film will be shown here in the UK and overseas. It's clear that despite the passage of time, it still has a resonance for today's audiences. Of course, the greater story remains the tragedy of the First World War and the Battle of the Somme in particular. But Geoffrey Malin's personality, his energy and his undoubted courage have combined to earn him a place in this chapter of our history.